I was a member of the World Bank team that actually went to Korea. Of course, I was working on Korea a few years before that to look at the Korean economy at the time they were facing stiff competition from their suppliers. The question was, well, what will happen to Korea if Malaysia and Philippines and uh, Indonesia and the rest of them, who supply them with raw materials, who are now able to uh, cut their margins to the barest minimum, you had to restructure the economy to find ways of staying in competition. It was the result of this large team that went to Korea to see how you restructure basically a labor intensive economy into a new direction so that they can continue to grow. That was where the, the term structural adjustment came about. And I spent a lot of time explaining to Nigeria that it was just uh, a name, although it became more popularized in other countries and so on. But each country's experience obviously had to be different. It had to be derived from their own peculiar conditions. There was nothing in the name that meant that your exchange rate had to go down or go up, that you had to reduce labor or add to labor. You had to now uh, restructure your policies, taxes, tariffs, exchange rates, uh, institutional policies, and so on and so forth. So it had to be particularly homegrown, but it had to follow a pattern of rationalization. Now, when IBB came on board, let me put it that way, and we listened to him, he, he said uh, something to the effect that Nigeria needed to break this on pass with the international organizations. All these discussions as, as to whether we were to get an IMF loan, we were to change this or change that in terms of our domestic and external policies. You have to have your programs in place, but in order to implement, you needed the funding. Well, typically, as you expect, IBB had all kinds of notions. They set up a team to monitor a debate, as somebody already mentioned. The debate was liberal, open, and everywhere. I will come back from some meetings, uh, international finance meetings. I'll come to Dodan Barracks, and uh, I will be asking the president, I say, what's been going on? He said, ah, they've been uh, attacking him left, right, and center. And I always sort of try to assure him. I say, don't worry, we are going to pull through. So you see, everything that has been said about his style, the way he was open, and everywhere, I, when people ask me, my colleagues at the World Bank or elsewhere, oh, people have this military guy. I say, no, no, our military government is a different style. It's a different kind of, it's not the militaristic type. Because IBB was close to everybody, traditional rulers, the politicians, the university people, and so on. There is no question that the leadership style was what really endeared people to IBB. President Babangida, like you have rightly said, is someone that I have not met while he was in office as president of this country. An event happened, in fact a tragic one. Twenty years ago, there was an armed robbery attack in my family house. It was violent. Mostly, no one lost his life, but many were badly bruised. Three days after, my security guard came into my house and said, there is a, a guest who won't see me. So he should let them in. I was taken aback. That gentleman was the former president in company of Alaji Ahmadu Abu Bakar, <coughs> late ABM Mohammed uh, Hamza. I was shocked beyond belief. I ushered them in, we sat down, and he said, this is why I'm here. One of your friends told me what happened. And I decided to personally come and commiserate with you. That coincided with a period when I was writing a doctoral thesis on some of the major economic crises facing the nations of Africa. After he left, I decided to make a U-turn, basically to look at some of the economic reform agenda 
of his administration while he was president. That led me to a change of topic, to economic diplomacy as a new face in Nigerian foreign policy. It's now a book, Economic Diplomacy and Nigerian Foreign Policy. <clears throat> In understanding basically the economic management model of Babangida administration, we shall not lose sight of where we were before he came in. So it's important to look at the historical facts of the Nigerian economic structure right from independence. We had an economy that was structured and designed to serve the needs and interests of colonial Britain and not that of the colony. That structural distortion and disarticulation were carried through up to mid-1980s. And by mid-1980s, the Nigerian economy was facing a major national crisis, a crisis of rising imports, falling prices of crude, which were the main source of funding of government activities. And by 87, the situation was really so pathetic that the nation current account position was so small, insignificant as to finance our import for 30 days. That was the meat of the economic crisis we are in as a nation. Earlier on, Economic Stabilization Act, otherwise known as austerity measures, was introduced by administration before that of IBB. But they failed to address some of the fundamental defects of the domestic economy. So the Lord spell on him to make a decision, a decision that had to fool the nation from a valley of despair and hopelessness where we were then, with the hope of placing it on the path of sustained growth and development. We have just listened to the Minister of Finance then. Structural Adjustment Program was one of the major policy initiatives of that administration with the primary objective of deregulating completely the economic environment. We have heard so much this morning and early afternoon on some of the early impacts and achievements of that particular economic program. You had a resurgence of agriculture. I believe others who will talk on that will make a specific example. It grew by more than 4 percent. We had a return to Exports as one of the mainstays of the Nigerian economy. Textile industries were, that were moribund all of a sudden came back to life. The garment and textile industry, for example, grew by about 3% within the first two years of self-implementation. The synthetic public subsector of the textile and garment industry grew much more by over 6%. The financial services industry witnessed a phenomenal growth from just about 20 to 22 deposit money banks. We had over 120 of them within a period of two years. Why? Because the sector was liberalized. There was free entry, free exit. Excessive regulation kills competition. By removal of some of those restrictions and bureaucratic bottlenecks, young and upwardly mobile Nigerians were encouraged to take a profession in banking and finance. We saw a resurgence of finance houses. We had six, over 600 of them within a period of three years. Over 400 in the public financial services subsector of the financial services industry. We had about 428 community banks. Quite a number of people have forgotten about the community banks and the role they played in helping the nation to manage some of the most difficult challenges impacting on it during that period. 
you had over 228 people banks that were equally licensed. So even the property question were, uh, was approached from a structured position. The resultant effects, an increase of specialized manpower, manning this critical sector of our national life. This afternoon, Osita was say, talking about the GT Bank. You have so many other banks that today, their combined revenues, more than the, the, the GDPs of most of states in Africa. Those things were not happened accidentally. They were a result of carefully laid out policies and actions and strategies of the man in charge of the moment. And that was President Ibrahim Baramasi Bapangira. I think the level of achievements that were put on the ground at a time when the total foreign reserve at the time he came into office was barely a billion USD, $932 million. That was what it was in 1987. The highest amount ever recorded during that period of 1991 was 4.04. We are talking of 34, 35 billion USD today. But in spite of those major negative challenges impacting on the nation within the financial sector, a lot has been said that the regime has been able to achieve the massive infrastructural development of the country. The first dualized uh, roads in the northern part of this country, Abuja Kaduna, I mean Abuja Kano, was done during that period. The movement to Abuja, amongst others. I don't need to go into the details because other speakers have already mentioned them for the lack of time. But suffice to say that the deregulation of the economic life of this country led for the first time to the decision by the government then to abrogate the indigenization decree of 1978. That decree, as good as it was at that point in our history, has done so much to restrict the level of foreign direct investment into the country. And immediately after the promulgation, the abrogation of the decree, what happened? You had massive investment, especially in the oil and gas sector of this country. 136 uh, licenses of oil were issued. At five of those licenses, at five percent of those licenses were taken by expatriate uh, companies, creating massive employment opportunities within the gas and oil industry of this country. So it was up and up. The marketing board, if you will recall, in order to help ordinary farmers and Nigerians who are within the vulnerable group, the regime scrapped the marketing boards in order to cause a connection to happen between the producers of the cash growth and the final buyers. That has helped significantly in returning back the groundnut pyramids in Kano. The cocoa farmers in Ondo, the resultant effect a positive growth in the gross domestic product of this country. These are, among others, some of the major policy economic measures that were unleashed positively on the nation uh, during the IBBS. And like other speakers have rightly said, it's important to look at some of the achievements, some of those policy prescriptions, so we'll be able to begin to develop policy responses to some of the monumental economic challenges that are negatively impacting on the Nigerian state. When you get the economy right, it's a natural conclusion that the politics will equally be right. Thank you so much. And, and you know, when you were speaking, the elimination of price control came to me as well yeah. as part of those uh, removal okay. as well during that era. Reduction of import duties. Yes. Um, you know, opening up the export sector, yes, sector. yes during that administration. And it, it is quite very critical and very instructive to note that the rural development and grassroots development was very key um, during that administration. And that brings me to Vice uh, Marshal Cunha. I mean, nobody will talk about rural development without going back to the basics, going back to the board, and also understanding what really he meant by that institution, the Rural Development uh, Platform. And 
I, I would want you to tell us a little more about that, the history. When people think about rural development, I know the first thing that comes to their mind is DFRI, you know, uh, the Directorate of you know, Rural Development and Food uh, Directorate. Tell us a bit about that. DFRI in action, his legacy, his legacy as far as DFRI is concerned, is that DFRI would continue and will continue to drive that different even out of office. Now, I have always harassed people. We always talk about microeconomics. You hear the uh, Governor Central Bank talking about microeconomics. That's fine. What about, sorry, macroeconomics? What about microeconomics? Who is taking care of that with the intensity that it deserves? But for us in the third world country, what about development economics? Because if we are not doing the things we need to do in those two areas, we're going to have a problem. Today, there is terrorism, there is banditry, unemployment, unemployment, hunger, hardship. Whether we want to believe it or not, these things are reality. The truth of the matter is that uh, people live in denial. And if people live in denial for some reason, then we won't solve some of our problems, fundamental problems. So, the rural area is where we should start this, I don't want to use the word restructuring of our development pattern. Um, I know some of you here also will not be afraid of ideas. The way things have been mapped out, in the near future, we would have grassroots communities having their 30-year perspective development plan. I go back to the era in which we belong. Okay, I can the rest of them. 30-year development perspective plan, three-year ruling plan, and the annual budget. And I would like to see that happen. A lot of work has been done. Um, well, <laughs> do I continue? OK. Uh, now, maybe a shorter way of doing that is there was there once was different the seven chapters. I'll just mention some of the types of things. Oh God, excuse me. In the nineteen, the broadcast talked about economic reconstruction, social justice, and self-reliance. Now, these are, for me, very fundamental things because economic reconstruction is still important for us because of what the problems we are facing. The question then is, what does economic reconstruction mean to the rural areas and the rural person? What does so social justice mean to them? What does self-reliance mean? Um, I talked about Professor Makanjuala. 
one of the things that we did in DIFRI, for which one is particularly happy about, is the technology thing. If you look at the uh, DIFRI experiment, you see a lot of that quietly. DIFRI also came up with the performance monitoring and evaluation system is a three-layered thing. Diffrey had a PME Diffrey person in the States. As programs are being executed by the state Diffrey's and local government Diffrey's, this PME officer that reports to headquarters directly will be there. We made sure that no PME director was posted to his state so that he doesn't get in involved with who gets what and all that. But we also made sure that he was posted to an area that is, is culturally uh, his own area. That that thing. Then there's the in-house inspection. We have people in the various departments went out to inspect how things were being done. And then the third layer, the highest layer, is the presidential monitoring team. And the leaders of those teams were meticulously chosen. People with integrity, with standing in the community. And I do recall the first one that went to Jaws. Solary. And the governor called to say, ah, sir, do you want to... I said, no, 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 it's nothing to do with persecuting you. We want to make sure that you have done what you are supposed to do. It, please, a round of applause. A round of applause. It, it is quite significant to look at that laying down of history, uh, especially um, talking about DIFRI, Directorate, Food, Roads and Rural Development. Uh, and it was something that was particularly very close to His Excellency's heart, seeing that the rural spaces were open and having, you know, leadership taken down to the grassroots. And I think that that was very significant. And to the rest of the world who are also looking and watching, that was one of the core aspects of his administration. You've been talking and, you know, making references to Professor Jerick and I a lot here. Yeah. And, you know, w when you talk about Diffrey as well, he, he comes to mind, not just when you talk about uh, the development, but about the orientation, you know, getting the voice of the people, which was something that His Excellency was very particular about. Looking at his style of governance, integration of ideas, um, the presidential advisory, you know, committee, which had a lot of experts, academics, civil society members, to share in the ideas and the decision making of his administration at that time. Prof, you, you, you are a man of many parts. We've watched you over the years, and little wonder now I understand why, you know, when I'm looking at history and where you started. And for a lot of young people, that is also significant. Because some of us say, is he a social advocate? Is he an activist? Is he a politician? You know, uh, you're a man of many parts. And listening to what he has said, it is very important for us to take a history step back. The, the role of orientation, how that led to people's understanding of social justice, to what we have now, as one of those legacies of His Excellency. So take us a bit into history. I mean, MAMSA, you know, you talk about mass mobilization of self-development, social justice, and economic recovery, which was one of your core areas as a leader and head in that administration. Take us a bit back. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, coming, as I do, from the home front, let me join others to really appreciate uh, Aisha, her siblings, and all those who have so very, very graciously arranged this uh, uh, legacy dialogue series. Very impressive. Let me also uh, convey to the great man celebrating his 80th birthday, congratulations. We are very, very delighted, very, very impressed that you are looking so well and healthy. May the Lord grant you many more years 
of joyful living. Uh, you have left a wonderful legacy. The question you ask, there are two sides to the mobilization approach. One has to do with uh, the, our own understanding of development. And this is where I really appreciate President Babangida being a man of ideas. He understood what development really means. And that's why he was able to accept these ideas about mobilizing people. In one of our documents, that is to say, in Nigeria's planning development document, we define for ourselves development, and I just uh, permit me to quote, development as a process which man's personality is enhanced. And it is that enhanced personality, creative, organized, and disciplined, which is the moving force behind the socioeconomic transformation of any society. That is to say, development does not start with goods and things. It starts with people, their reorientation, organization, discipline, direction, energy. It's the people. And so he, he brought that idea very clearly that real development does not come from outside, does not come from money, does not come from resources. It comes from the creative ideas of the people. <clears throat> But unless the people are mobilized, unless they are organized, unless they are disciplined, unless they are moving in a particular direction, things don't happen. And that is why he accepted the idea, first and foremost, of uh, our being in Difri. I was in Difri in charge of rural mobilization. <clears throat> because the rural people also have to be mobilized and organized and arranged and disciplined. And so, in addition to providing roads and uh, water and uh, other things to facilitate real development, the real production comes from the producers. And the producers are the rural people. And we have to respect them, we have to educate them, we have to organize them, we have to make them feel part of the process. So, that emphasis is uh, what gave me my first, uh, uh, with my, my big boss here, he was the chairman of the directorate. I was in charge of uh, uh, rural mobilization. And uh, we came to understand very, very clearly that you can't go far in this process <coughs> of development if you don't carry the people. Because they are the real developers. They are the ones who bring about development. They bring development in being. You may have the money, you may have the... It doesn't... Money is on its own. Does not, it's the people who work, who produce. So, with that perspective, we went around and made sure that every community in Nigeria, and he has the figures up to now, <laughs> just to make sure that every community is mobilized within the context of their own you know, uh, production processes. But we discovered that there were two other things that they were lacking. They were lacking access to finance. Very, very serious. Little money, but they don't have it. And the banks that we have are very far away. And even if they do, usually they don't have the paper to be able to qualify. This is what brought in the idea of the people's bank and community banks. Well, I must say, my, my guy here and myself, we feel very, very sad that community banks have been turned to something else. And they should have left the community banks to be there. They are the people's bank. They are the, people's, they are the ones who are connecting. And believe me, 95% of the ordinary people were very faithful in repaying their loans. We had no problem with it. They don't run away with it. They are very honest. But then we, you know, I think they've now been turned, I don't know what they call them now. They are no longer people's bank, no community bank. They say microfinance. They've messed them up. I, 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 I must confess that we salute uh, President Babangida. He respected that connection very much. That the, immediately the ideas were brought, he approved them. Community Bank, Professor Mark Mujia was the chairman of the board, and uh, we were all just happy if the ordinary people could access the money they need for production. And it was happening in a wonderful way. We should have strengthened that instead of uh, creating what is now done. Now, that is the rural development aspect of the mobilization. The other aspect of mobilization, which I was now engaged in, that's why I was not taken away from uh, Difri to Mamsa, well, at the political bureau report in 1986-87, they had a very, very intensive debate around the country and came out with the political bureau report. And the report 
said very clearly that if democracy is to be rooted in Nigeria, then the people, the voters, the people must be educated politically to know their rights, to know their responsibilities, to know the, that the, the power in a democracy resides with the people. It is not with the, the, the people elected, it is the people. But if they don't understand it, they will throw away this. And so we are a kind of uh, panel as the Directorate of Social Mobilization to prepare the people for democracy. And we did very, very well. So well that we had one of the best elections so far conducted in Nigeria in 1993. Unfortunately, I will ask my ogre, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but the answers have been given for the nullification of that election. Uh, and uh, we agree uh, that uh, there are all sorts of forces, uh, you know, uh, kind of came into force. But we did the work of educating the people very, very seriously. What we are saying there is this. Development of any nation depends on what people do. Do it excellently. Whatever you are doing for the society is very serious. Take your work seriously. Take your function seriously. Don't look down upon what you are doing. It's truly important. And it's all this participation that brings and kind of multiplies into a transformation of the society. I think that our program went very well. The one that we have serious difficulty with is... Uh, the issue of corruption. The issue of corruption. And it's something that has to be on and on and on. But we started with Operation Social Justice and the Operation, uh, uh, you know, kind of anti corruption problem. But the issue of corruption in any society is something that you cannot avoid. You have to continue because it is like a, a, a kind of a cancer. You know, if you don't really look at it, it kind of covers the whole place. So it has to be something that must be continuous. But at that time, uh, both the president and all the leadership were very serious about the issue of making sure that public service is really done with such integrity, with such uh, 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 probity, so that uh, we, we do not, as it were, give the impression as if we are cheating the people instead of serving them. Thank you. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> we have... Um a national orientation agency right now. I relate it to Mamsa of those days, in your time. And every time, all we see about national orientation agency is television appearances. We see him and his group occasionally on TV, talking and so on and whatever. They are not doing the type of work that you people did. Yes, they, they are not, because I believe that where we are today, if we have a mobilization of people, that is, both at the rural and even the urban levels, the country will not be where it is today. People will be more aware, people will know what their rights are and how to fight for them, both men and women. And so that is a very important point in what we are doing. And now, um, before I go on to Better Life Program, to start, I was not the chairperson of Better Life Program. Mrs. Mariam Babangida was the convener and the chairperson <laughs> of the Better Life Program. Yes. Now my journey into oil and gas. The first chairman I worked with was Jubril Amino. Again, it's different from what is happening today. Because in those days, there was no question of ethnicity. There was no question of bringing somebody from my backyard or somebody, somebody introduced somebody. I was in my house one evening, and this man called me and said, Mrs. Maduk, I said, yes. I have some job for you. Will you do it? I said, why not? Because at that time, he was Minister of Education, and he had just been appointed to Petroleum. I said, yes. He said, uh, this is one young lady who used to come and bother me in my office about women education. Women education. I, said, I, said, yes. I said, yes. So what do you so have, for, you me? have for me? I said, OK. I said, Will you do it? I said, whatever it is, once it's coming from you, I'll do it. And so the and following, so the following morning, morning, 
he called me and said, I am appointing you as the first woman on the board of NNPC, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. I didn't know what it meant, honestly. I just said, oh, minister, thanks very much. OK, we'll hear more about it. Now, other people started hearing. Unfortunately, I think that weekend was the weekend of the Oka coup. And um, the list of new board members was published. And some of my friends called and said, oh, well, that your board appointment is over now because there has been a coup. I said, what? Well, they say, oh, I said, well, that's okay. That's if it's, okay. Gone, it's gone, it's gone. But that's who did not succeed. And uh, our dear IBB continued. And that was how we continued. Now, the Better Life program was already launched because I'm talking about 1990. And, um, the Maria must, must have been part, part of how, how I got in, got because, in because I still believe, I still believe a board as strong as NNPC, as NNPC could, not could not be decided, decided only by Jubril Amino, definitely, Lamino, definitely Lamino, would have cleared with the top. And we started. And, we started. and, and after, after some time, time his own uh, board, board was changed. changed. I noticed, I noticed that, that every time the NNPC, the NNPC board was board changed, was changed. I will, I will be retained. And, and uh, our, our chairman, chairman at that time, time Imo Itsweli, some, some of you may know him. Know. We were going, we going to, to River State on a visit, on an official, official visit. visit. And coming back, back Imo said, I have, I have something for you to for do. You. I said, are you sure? Are you Is sure? that right? He said, yes. I said, OK. Again, whatever you have for me to do. He said, he said, there is a, there project, is a project, Nigerian, Nigerian liquefied natural gas project, gas project, which was started, which was started in 1965, 1965 at first, first and still and yet is not, taken, not off. taken off. Do you think do you, you can, can do, do it? it? I said, why not? I said, I, I can do, do it. it. Just, Just give me the give right people. Will you allow, allow me to choose the people to work with? He said, yes, anything you want will give you. So I said, I want the best accountant, I want the best lawyer, I want the best administration, I want this. And so we put a group together, and that was how we started on the Nigeria LNG project. And at that time, the people we call IOCs, the oil companies, international oil companies, were sabotaging this project. All the All meetings, meetings were being were held in Shell's office, office in London. In London. And they will, and they will carry our people to London, London, give them very nice very lunch, lunch and, so and so on, and they will and come, they back, come back and nothing, nothing, was, nothing happening. was happening. So, so first, of all, first of all, I moved, I moved that, that office, office to, to the, the NNPC, NNPC office, office in London. London. I, said, I said, this, this project, project is going to be moved to the, to the London, to the London, London NNPC, NNPC office. office. And people didn't people like didn't it. Like and then the and process, the process I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to I'm take going quite to a bit, quite of, your bit of your time. Yes. yes. The, the process, process which was which to be was used, used at that time, time. had been tried in Nigeria, had been tried in a few other places, and it was not successful. So I'm not an oil or chemical uh, engineering person, but I had to I read, had everything. To read everything. And, and we visited we Malaysia, Malaysia, where they had, they had very successful, very successful LNG, 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 LNG project. project. We visited we visit Indonesia, Indonesia where, where they were already, already on their 12th train, 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 train at the different, at different uh, units, uh, units of production. production. And, and so we came so back, back and we said, OK, we are going to do this. We started. All the meetings, All the meetings, meeting in London, London meeting in Nigeria, Nigeria doing that, doing that, doing that. Anyway, anyway, at the end, end we, were we were able to, able to and, and all, the time, all the time, I must say, I, must say, I, had, I had the support, the support of this of very good man in Dodan Barracks, 
and I had the support of his wife, and I had the support of everybody. But it was everything was kept under wraps. So the board of the Nigeria LNG at that time had to be dissolved. I think it was the time of uh, Okongu. Okongu was minister then. And they were given the alternative. Do you want to stay on this board or do you want to? Some of them were already committed to different contractors. But um, I didn't care about that. And so that board was dissolved and a new board was constituted. I wasn't on the board of LNG, but I chaired the committee, the NNPC committee, that brought it into fruition. And I'm very proud today. Well, so when government is boasting that they are realizing so many billion dollars in a dividend, it was the work of these very good people in NNPC who didn't trade their souls for this project. Although at the end we had to reach a compromise. Shell was to submit, nominate the managing director all the time. And then NPC would bring in the deputy managing director, and then all the professional heads were shared out, you know, as appropriate. So, and then it was also decided that I think Asiodu was the Minister of Petroleum at that time. It was decided that um, Nigeria will be a minority shareholder. And that is why that company is still standing. If Nigeria, so we've been talking about privatization all this time. Actually, unless we decide to take government out of business, I'm not sure we are going anywhere. Nigeria is a very beautiful place, but we are going nowhere unless we allow the private sector to determine some of these issues. And we don't have to be parochial about it. We don't have to be ethnic. We just must allow this country to grow. If we don't, we are going to be worse than we are today. We are going to have more, conflict, more conflicts because all the young children coming behind us will also want a piece of the cake. And they are not just going to be looking at you older people, cutting away everything. So, um, so we, that's, that's uh, Nigeria LNG as it is. They are, when you are talking of IBB and his government, those are the strong cans behind IBB. Doctor, I think there were three of you. Oh, he's, he's looking down. <laughs> so, um, I have a, I said, uh, Omobola should write me the list. I'm sorry, as I said, when I start talking, okay, carry on, please. When we, the, those of us who, when I looked on, uh, I looked in Google to find out if there is still a Better Life program there. And uh, what I got there was that the uh, Better Life program team was wives of governors. It was not wives of governors because the wives also had to form their own Better Life uh, programs at the state levels. We will go into a state capital. We went to Bauchi, we went to Maidugore, we went to Sokoto, we went to Kaduna, we went to uh, Niger, everywhere. We went everywhere. And one of the things which uh, socially, which we were trying to remove at that time, was the way women were repressed in everywhere. It's much better now, but we are still not there yet. Where women cannot inherit land. Women, in most parts of Igbo land, I don't know what it will be like in other places now, women cannot inherit land. I think a law was passed in one of the states not too long ago, you know, liberalizing that, about women and inheritance. Then there are widowhood practices. In Benin, if uh, your husband happened to die, 
I read about that, unfortunately, only recently about one. If you lose your husband, they will say you killed him. And they will wash the body and say you must drink that water. All this we were trying to combat at that time. When I married my husband, they said uh, one of the women, the husband just uh, died. When I got there, we saw, I saw this woman in a hut. I said, what is this? They said, eh, the, uh, the husband died and she had to stay in that hut outside of the house for three months before she can come in. Yes, widows could not sleep in the house when the husband dies. She must stay outside in a little hut that they built for her. And she doesn't bath in the afternoon. She must bath only at night where people will not see her or whatever. And in some of these cases, you come out, when your husband dies, you come out every morning to mourn him. Eh, 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 eh. You shout. <laughs> you shout and shout for some time before you come in every morning if you lose your husband. So different types of widowhood practices. I'm afraid that was one of the uh, ones that impressed me most. Then education. We had to try and educate the women for financing and building them up economically. We formed them into cooperatives so that they can be each other's keeper. And then taught them, how do you manage your finances? Being in a cooperative is a sort of um, having a, a surety in a bank or anywhere, because they know that if you are in a cooperative of about 50 women, you are not going to run away with the money. They kill you. So this was done for some in some of the communities. And so there were so many programs. We started having trade fairs. Again, unfortunately, we couldn't continue that. But we had, we, I think we, we, we had a few. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> we had a few in Lagos. And the first time we brought uh, the rural women to Lagos, we lodged them in Federal Palace Hotel. <laughs> I think that was the joke of the whole thing. And we found that some of them had never used a toilet before. They had never used a bath before. Yes, and all sorts of things happened there. But we were able to bring women and their produce from the different corners and sections of the country to Lagos to exhibit at the trade fair. And slowly, it started catching on. There is one which uh, I always remember, and uh, my husband reminds me every time. Especially, there is an advert on TV, those of you who watch TV, of, um, of a, one of the local kings, that the rain catcher. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we command that that time because if it's uh, during the rainy season, they will say all the white cap chiefs in Lagos will say, if you do not pay them, it's going to rain. You will not enjoy this your uh, trade fair. Eh, you remember? Uh -huh. You will you will not enjoy this your trade fair, and therefore, poor Mariam will have to pay the rain catchers. Before starting, before starting the trade fair. And of course, I was in charge of organizing most of the things. So I know we had to pay the rain catcher, we had to uh, hire people who will build the tents, the different groups, the yam, this, that, and so on. And so there was one year that this uh, rain catcher, I, I don't know what happened. Either they didn't pay them in time or something. We were in the middle of, I think it was at the close of that uh, particular trade fair. Oh, goodness. The rain 
started, the rain started. So, so uh, Mrs. Babangida had to say, please, where are these rain catchers? What have you done? <laughs> What have you done with them? So we, people ran, went and collected uh, Lagos uh, white cap chiefs and uh, rain catchers. And within about 30 minutes to an hour, this rain stopped. Whether it was because of them or in spite of them, I wouldn't know. <laughs> so those are some of the interesting things. But what it created for us was it opened us to all the difficulties in Nigeria. We are different peoples, but we must please make sure and attempt that we retain this country as a country. People have labored for this country, and people will continue to hope for the best. Uh, so <laughs> wow, well, please, another round of applause. That was quite an insight. I mean, uh, if we look at the population of the world today, seven billion and counting, half of that is made up of women. And one man had the foresight, as early as far back as then, to think of a gender-sensitive agenda. And had women in very sensitive positions. And even then was the creation of the women, Ministry of Women Affairs, amongst others, and commissions. So I think it's very instructive to say that he laid down the legacies that we are honoring today. And, and the Women's Center, absolutely, a lot of them. So not to keep us here any longer, this is where we draw the cutting. Um, I want to say thank you to my wonderful, distinguished, erudite, and very assertive panelists uh, from Dr. Musa Babayo, it was a privilege to do this with you. And um, I know that there has been a lot of learning for a lot of people out there.